We have gathered this morning right as the sun is coming up to celebrate that fact. Because he conquered the grave, we can have new life. I don't know about you, but I am glad I am not the person I once was. And God is continuing to transform us. Lord, this morning as we have gathered and those have gathered around the world, as the sun is breaking the horizon, some congregations are meeting outside, some by cemetery, some indoors, but they are meeting declaring that you have conquered the grave. We thank you, Lord, for the Good Friday message and the community gathering together. But, Lord, this is the day. This is the day that you have made. Where all of your promises we could see were fulfilled. That we can trust you. And so today we have gathered to hear from you, to listen, to celebrate, to worship. We are praying that you would have your way for this service in the next. Let this day truly be a day of celebration. And Lord, this, this Sunday, we're going to praise you for you have risen. In Jesus' name, amen. today we're missing a, we're missing somebody here today but we're gonna we're gonna plow through this with um, a duet so um, just won't you just praise our savior with us this morning as we're lifting up his voice in this song From the moment man first disobeyed the Father, we were then held captive by our sins. The law of God demanded a sacrifice, restoring to himself his own again. So the Lamb, his only Son, was freely offered, atonement for our sins forever made. He innocent and holy, still God and God only, could ransom and redeem us back again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings His praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. So to the cross they carried him with all our guilt and all our sin. The Lamb of God was slain for our transgressions. And on the cross those nail-pierced hands Reached up to God and down to man And just as if I'd never sinned He took me in his arms Embracing me He willingly forgave For mercy 
mercy, grace, and love that knows no bounds. Though guilty and condemned, I now am free. Forever I'm forgiven, for Christ the Lord has risen, and risen with him we will one day be. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings His praise again. swords and turn to Luke chapter 24 verse 1 Luke 24 verse 1 why you're turning Lucy Perkins has a special um, message this morning she wanted to tell you through me that she has been praying for you and she's excited to come home yeah praise the Lord Well, he is risen. That's right. Did you know that the first recorded sunrise service was in Hern Hut, Germany? Who here knew that? Yep, yep. Well, I didn't know it either, so don't feel bad about that. Hern Hut, Germany, a couple of young men, Moravian. Germans went to celebrate sunrise service. The following year, they told their congregation, and the entire congregation would come to celebrate sunrise at the local cemetery. After that, a tradition was born, and it began with the Moravians there in Germany. One of their leaders, Nicholas Zizendorf, would befriend a young man. His name would be John Wesley. John Wesley's life would be changed and transformed through the Moravians. And we know the rest of the story. He would start the Methodist Church. Then from that, in 1908, the Church of the Nazarene was born. It all began 2,000 years ago when a few women went to the tomb. So look with me this morning at Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. As soon as the Sabbath was over, and it is now Sunday morning, the women go out to the tomb. Now remember, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they have already prepared Jesus' body, but the women have to go. Whether they felt like it wasn't prepared enough or they were going to care for his hands and his feet, put spices and put flowers around him, we're not for sure, but they have this need to go to the tomb And so they set out. And as they set out early in the morning, and it's still dark, they can't but reflect on the past seven days. Seven days that seemed like a lifetime. And I imagine it all began with them talking about Palm Sunday. You remember how we shared about Palm Sunday last week? The juxtaposition or the contrast between what the disciples were feeling and what was going on in Jerusalem. Remember, the disciples had recently just heard Jesus say that he was going to be betrayed and die. And they were confused. Right after that, we see Peter telling Jesus a second time, Jesus says, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And Peter says, no, that's never going to happen. And Peter is rebuked by Jesus. He says those words, get behind me, Satan. I'm sure that was hard to hear from Peter. And then he tells them again. And it says they become physically upset. It's an emotional roller coaster for the disciples. But something completely different is happening in Jerusalem. Because in Jerusalem, there's an excitement in the air, there's an anticipation. They are reading the old prophecies. They begin, whispers are beginning going through the crowd that Jesus just might in fact be the Messiah. And I can hear Mary tell Joanna as they are walking to the tomb, and do you remember what it was like as we entered in and Jesus was riding on the donkey and the place exploded She says, I can't help myself. I was one of the ones who began screaming Hosanna. But then Joanna says, yeah, Mary. But seeing things seem to change on Monday. The atmosphere began to change. Do you remember, Mary? Do you remember how it began as Jesus left Martha and Mary's And it started with him cursing that fig tree. I don't understand why he cursed that fig tree. And then he went into the temple and he began turning over the tables, saying, you have turned my father's house into a place of thieves and robbers when it's supposed to be a place of prayer. Can I just pause for just a moment from the lady's perspective? The fig tree is something that we see throughout Scripture, often used and yet misunderstood. Do you know that the fig tree is mentioned 47 times, starting from Genesis going all the way to Revelation? Now, 
I don't want to give too much away. I shared this Wednesday night for those that come Wednesday night because I believe this will be a full-on sermon. But Jesus was making a point with the cursing of the fig tree that they didn't understand right, right then in that moment. I'm not sure how many got it afterwards. I think John did. If you, and I don't want you to turn, but if you were to go back to Jeremiah in chapters 8 and 9, Jeremiah mentions the fig tree. And in that, he prophesies. So God is using and speaking through Jeremiah, and he says this. Because you have rejected God and his word, the fig tree will bear no fruit. There will be no harvest for you. Now watch this. As Jesus is getting ready to enter in to Jerusalem and the temple, he curses the fig tree, which was confusing for the disciples, confusing for the women, because it wasn't even time for fruit to come yet. But what he was declaring was this. Just as the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that this fig tree would bear no fruit because you did not trust in the Lord or his word, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and who did the religious leaders reject? God himself. In fact, it would be John, and we just read it earlier, who would say, and the word became flesh. They rejected the word, and so the harvest had passed. Can I tell you this morning, don't miss the harvest. Well, the women continue after they're talking about Monday, because then the other Mary speaks up, and she says, yes, but what about Tuesday? Tuesday was also strange. It was strange how Jesus went up on the Mount of Olives and began talking about the destruction of the temple, destruction of the earth, his coming again. I still don't understand it. That he said there would be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation. How his followers will per be persecuted, put to death, hated by nations. Yes, says Joanna. But what was really scary when he said there would be an abomination in the temple and how dreadful it would be for pregnant women and nursing mothers because there will be such great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world. And then Joanna says, and then he mentions the fig tree again. I still don't understand this fig tree. When Mary Magdalene then speaks up and she says, yes, but we had Wednesday. And I picture the women at that moment walking in silence for a long way without saying a word. Do you know in Scripture, it gives very detailed accounts about Sunday, about Monday, about Tuesday, about Thursday, and Friday. But there is nothing very specific about Wednesday. And I think that's intentional. I think Jesus went back to Lazarus's, Mary and Martha's, with the disciples and the women, those closest to him. And he knew what was coming. And it was his last day with them. And they told stories.